Okay, so I am also recording. Welcome, everybody. This is Sam Albrecht. I'm with the Office of Regulatory Oversight, and I work with the Building Codes and Standards Program, and, and Donnie Featherman is the program manager there. Um, we, I have a PowerPoint, but I'm not going to really launch that right now unless we uh, need to. It's, it's a fairly straightforward agenda today. Uh, we want to talk about uh, we've got some uh, ICC guests with us uh, that are going to talk about the new standards, uh, 1200, 1205, and 1210. And then we're going to, our, our goal is to uh, potentially adopt those as guidance standards, uh, not to replace the building codes, but to supplement with. Uh, and we've seen several other states uh, do something similar. So, uh, with that, uh, I may have to make whoever's presenting. Uh, Kevin, are you presenting or Leslie, are you presenting for? Ryan will be. I'm sorry, who will be? Ryan Coker. Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hello. How are you doing? Good. I can see that. So uh, we're going to just go ahead and, and jump into that. Just uh uh, just a reminder, we have both uh, Technical Advisory Committee members uh, committee members here, and they have priority on questions. We have a few uh, non-committee members. Uh, they are welcome to ask questions, too. It's a fairly small group now. I anticipate at the next meeting when I uh, kind of throw out where we are uh, to all the uh, different building departments and uh, the entire stakeholder list. We may have a few more visitors at the next meeting, uh, but right now it looks uh, like it's still gonna be a fairly small group. Uh, I'm not sure who HC 1037 is, but we just added you to the uh, uh, list also, so. Uh, and uh, I am watching the chat, and Chris, uh, that's fine. Uh, welcome. welcome. Uh, these are public meetings and are publicly noticed, and anybody can participate. Um, and if you've got any questions along the way, just uh, raise your hand or, or jump in. Uh, but uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Ryan, you want to kind of introduce your team and the topic? Sure, and really appreciate the opportunity to share today. Uh, I'm Ryan Kolker, Vice President of Innovation at the International Code Council, uh, direct our center of focus on energy resilience and innovation, really sort of looking at opportunities to assist the building industry uh, and uh, regulatory authorities in addressing a lot of the challenges uh, that they face. Uh, from the ICC side, I'm also joined by uh, Leslie Garland, uh, who's our uh, Vice President of State and Local Affairs and also engages uh, directly with uh, State of Colorado, uh, and Kevin McOsker, who's our uh, Vice President of Technical Services, uh, who former code official uh, from Las mm -hmm. Vegas, uh, and, and so uh, certainly well-versed in, in sort of the technical aspects of the codes. Um, so between the three of us, certainly happy uh, to present today, answer any questions you have today, or uh, moving forward into the future. Um, so I'm going to jump in and, and provide a little bit of uh, sort of perspective on ICC's approach to offsite construction, a little bit on the standards, um, and then hopefully answer um, any questions uh, that folks may have. You know, for this group, probably don't need to spend, uh, you know, sort of a ton of time on this, but did want to provide a little perspective on a sort of ICC's vision uh, or sort of focus on offsite construction, you know, as an opportunity to address a whole host of different challenges that communities and industries facing, um, workforce challenges, sustainability, affordability, sort of all of these pieces. And sort of given um, you know, where, where ICC sits, um, you know, code standards and other support tools are really our mechanism to be able to help deliver uh, offsite construction solutions. Um, you know, we're also seeing uh, you know, increased focus on offsite construction as an opportunity to address the affordable housing crisis, uh, including, you know, from the White House. Um, I think, you know, one important uh, sort of line here from um, the, the uh, administration's housing plan uh, is HUD is also working to address hurdles to modular and panelized housing posed by inconsistent state and local inspection requirements and standards. 
which limit economies of scale and potential cost savings. And so, again, that's an area where ICC in particular sort of looks to uh, sort of address uh, those particular challenges. Uh, and so this map really sort of demonstrates the challenge that we see um, you know, within sort of leveraging the efficiencies that offsite construction uh, provides. So as you'll note, uh, multiple different colors on uh, the map, the sort of greens and grays represent um, states that have uh, statewide uh, offsite construction programs um, like Colorado. Um, but even within states that do have those programs, there's a wide variation on sort of how those programs operate. Uh, and so if you think about sort of a factory that wants to be uh, super efficient, that wants to deliver um, housing units or other building units uh, regionally, dealing with sort of this discrepancy uh, creates challenges and inefficiencies uh, in that process. And so if we really want to help sort of advance uh, offsite construction, uh, we really need to sort of look at those challenges. Uh, states in yellow uh, or orange um, do not have statewide programs and sort of leave that um, ultimately to uh, local jurisdictions uh, to regulate uh, offsite construction, which in and of itself, you know, creates other challenges. Uh, and if you look at sort of the, the region, you know, surrounding uh, Colorado, uh, you have, uh, you know, some variation in, uh, you know, approaches uh, to offsite construction. Uh, I will note um, one uh, sort of recent bright spot uh, is Utah, uh, which is establishing a statewide program uh, based off of uh, ICC MBI standards 1200 and 1205, um, which we'll talk about. Um, and so, you know, that sort of presents an opportunity to align regionally uh, around uh, approaches uh, and allow both, you know, sort of manufacturers in Colorado to better deliver products uh, to Utah because of consistency. Um, and allow you know others uh, in the surrounding region uh, to support uh, offsite construction solutions uh, within the state of Colorado. Um, I'll also note we saw uh, 1200 and 1205 uh, adopted uh, by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Recently, the General Services Administration included uh, the standards within um, their design criteria. Uh, and then we saw uh, FEMA as part of uh, the Maui Fire Recovery uh, include 1200 and 1205 as the basis for approval of offsite construction, uh, you know, with under that uh, RFP. So just sort of generally, you know, why, why standards are good. Um, we talked a little bit about that already, uh, opening up the opportunity for new markets, providing consistency, um, addressing inefficiencies in the process, uh, leveraging opportunities to uh, use expertise from uh, third-party providers, uh, including supporting, uh, in many cases, uh, enhanced turnaround times, consistency, and assuring that uh, quality assurance is there uh, throughout the process. And so based off of um, sort of those recognized needs, um, ICC, working with the Modular Building Institute and others, uh, has been developing a suite of standards to help support uh, those activities. Um, I'll go a little bit more detail into um, each of these, um, but you know, looking for sort of additional opportunities to address um, challenges and working with states and localities uh, to bring that regulatory consistency uh, through through the use of the standards. Um, relative to sort of the development process, um, the standards were developed through an open uh, consensus-based process. Uh, here were members of the committee, including uh, state regulators from uh, Virginia, uh, Texas, uh, and Maryland, uh, and Michigan, uh, but also uh, you know, receiving broad uh, public input uh, from across uh, the industry. So when we talk about uh, offsite construction uh, relative to the standards, um, probably not uh, you know, too different uh, of a definition uh, you know, used in Colorado, but uh, produced in a factory, uh, closed construction that doesn't, uh, you know, support sort of inspection at the uh, local level without sort of undoing um, what was done in the factory. And so um, standards 1200 and 1205 really work as companions, really two sides of the same equation. So uh, 1200 covers planning, design, fabrication, and assembly, really focused at um, designers, architects, engineers, contractors, fabricators, uh, transporters, 
um, and assembly, uh, sort of that side of the equation. Uh, so, you know, sort of what are the requirements relative to sort of each of those uh, actors uh, within the space. Uh, I, and then Ryan, here's- can you go back well, uh, sure. one, maybe two slides now? I think, I think it's important that bottom statement on that slide uh, it, it is important for the, the TAC to understand. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as folks know, um, HUD manufactured housing is covered by um, the HUD code. Um, and so this, the standards, um, you know, do not cover, uh, you know, that uh, typology. Um, also, the standards are uh, focused on basically any element of uh, closed offsite construction. So um, whether that's Componentized, panelized, or modularized elements, and Thanks. that's across the across the board uh, for the standards. Yeah, no, absolutely appreciate that. Um, so, did just want to provide a, a snapshot of um, the the table of contents. Um, the standards are available for viewing on uh, if you just go to codes.iccsafe.org uh, and punch in twelve hundred or twelve oh five. You can certainly dig uh, a little bit deeper. Uh, but did want to give a sense of sort of what's covered um, in the standards. Uh, as I mentioned, 1205 is the flip side uh, to 1200. So it covers the inspection and regulatory process, uh, really sort of third party um, requirements, uh, in plant and on site inspections, uh, permitting processes. The role of uh, the uh, state programs versus local uh, authorities, and again, you know, focusing on sort of the uh, the third parties um, and any sort of regulatory requirements um, and how that meshes with uh, the state programs. So again, here's the um, sort of table of contents, giving a sense of sort of what's covered um, in the standards uh, themselves. So did want to, um, you know, we did provide a, an analysis on um, sort of the, the differences between the current uh, Colorado regs and the 1200 and 1205 uh, standards. Uh, we'll mention that there's not a, a ton of uh, differences. Um, these are, are sort of the ones that, uh, you know, we particularly noted. Um, 1200 and 1205 includes an expanded list of uh, third party uh, qualifications. So what does it take to be an approved third party? Um, there's a section on uh, sort of ongoing performance evaluation of those third parties. Um, a little bit on uh, in factory quality assurance personnel qualifications uh, and a little more detail on uh, the QA manual requirements themselves. Um, but again, I think those are particularly relevant if we're talking about sort of regulatory consistency you know, if a factory is delivering, um, you know, product to multiple different uh, states with different requirements, having sort of streamlined qualifications and manual requirements, I think are a key area uh, to support uh, efficiency. Uh, a little bit on uh, sort of material and label controls. Um, and then uh, I think the biggest difference is the allowance of third party uh, plan review uh, within 1200 and 1205. I think the important thing to note is, um, you know, 1200 and 1205 are intended to be sort of models and adaptable um, to, you know, the jurisdiction's needs. So, um, you know, certainly providing the regulatory consistency is important, but, you know, also recognizing that there are nuances from, you know, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, just some sort of thoughts on uh, adopting uh, the standards. Um, they can be adopted uh, as standalone. They could be adopted as part of a regular code adoption process. They could be incorporated into uh, existing uh, regulations. Um, there is an effort to have uh, 1200 and 1205 incorporated into the IBC and IRC uh, for 2027. Uh, Kevin is convening folks uh, to help move that effort forward. So if folks are interested um, in that, um, certainly reach out to Kevin. And then um, just a, a list and timeline of uh, the adoptions of uh, 1200 and 1205. Um, recognizing sort of the, the broader support um, that 1200 and 1205 have received, um, the National Association of Home Builders uh, has passed a resolution 
uh, to support uh, 1200 and 1205 adoption, uh, particularly because of the regulatory consistency uh, and the opportunities uh, that that provides. Uh, we've also seen uh, ABC Collaborative, uh, which is an effort from the U.S. Department of Energy to sort of bring folks uh, together uh, to address uh, challenges in bringing advanced construction uh, to the marketplace. Again, sort of recognizing the patchwork of uh, regulation uh, and the, the benefit that uh, standardization uh, provides in that space. I will touch uh, sort of briefly on uh, 1210 and guideline six. Uh, 1210 dives a little bit deeper into specifically uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. So opportunities to uh, support uh, testing of those systems in the factory, um, any potential challenges uh, that those systems may face uh, through uh, transportation, um, and really sort of uh, diving into um, sort of the entire process as it relates to uh, MEP systems. Again, you know, sort of covering um, componentized, panelized, or uh, modularized uh, elements. And really, the, the 1210 is, is slots well into uh, 1200 and 1205, really following sort of a similar format uh, and diving in uh, specifically you know, to those MEP elements. Guideline six um, is a, a recent publication, really thinking through um, how do we move to a, a potentially more systemized or um, productized approach uh, to offsite construction. Uh, particularly in the panelized space where there is you know, huge opportunities for uh, replicability while also allowing for uh, some degree of sort of variation uh, from panel to panel. Really, uh, if folks are familiar <laughs> with uh, the product evaluation process, really sort of marrying the product evaluation process with the offsite construction approvals process, uh, really looking at opportunities to enhance uh, quality assurance and documentation uh, which then would allow uh, this productized approach, uh, but then also uh, sort of having the concept of sub panels and super panels. So you have an approved sub panel or suite of sub panels, being able to configure them in multiple different ways and have that uh, super panel uh, be approved because it's made of uh, approved sub panels and put together in um, an approved way. Um, so uh, I, I basically just sort of just went uh, you know, through that uh, sort of process relative to um, guideline six uh, and the thinking there. Um, did want to also uh, just make folks aware, uh, we will have uh, offsite construction experience at our annual conference uh, in October uh, in Long Beach, uh, really sort of providing additional opportunities for uh, folks to engage around challenges and needs uh, relative to offsite construction, but also providing uh, you know, educational uh, opportunities for uh, code officials and others uh, within the industry as well. So would certainly encourage folks, um, if you are interested in participating you know, at the conference, um, we would love to have you. So I think um, that's, that's probably a good, good place to start. I know that was pretty quick, but i um, happy to jump into any questions that, that folks may have. Thank you, Ryan. I want to turn it over to the TAC members in just a second, but just for some clarification purposes, 1200 and 1205 seem to, pretty, to, to be pretty solid and, and being adopted. 1210, are we seeing uh, that had a different date on it, had a 2023 date on it. Is it pretty well fleshed out and are we seeing adoption on that? Um, so uh, as you noted, 1210 is uh, more recent. Uh, we have seen a couple states um, take a look at it. Um, I think at this stage, it's you know probably sort of less important um, than, than getting the, the 1200 and 1205 um, standards in place because those standards sort of set the framework, uh, which then you know allows for um, you know, sort of ability to dive a little bit deeper into, um, you know, specific systems. Um, but there's no reason why, you know, it couldn't be adopted um, as, as a complete package. Thank you. And then uh, I appreciate you bringing up the uh, G6 uh, 2023. Donnie and I and the TAC have uh, started to have discussions about 
how to get on top of panelized um, uh, efforts. And so is this ICC's approach uh, to do that? Yeah, so we, uh, again, brought together a suite of experts, uh, including uh, regulators from Virginia and California uh, to sort of take that approach and really bring sort of that expertise from uh, the product evaluation sphere and the offsite construction sphere together uh, to really support uh, panelized systems and being able to treat them, you know, sort of more as uh, products and systems. Um, so we've also sort of brought in um, some sort of lessons learned internationally as well, um, Japan, uh, Sweden, and elsewhere. So um, yeah, it seems like uh, a potential approach to address uh, panelized systems, particularly to um, potentially support more automation in that space. Um, we haven't seen sort of a ton of investment in automation, which then, you know, sort of brings efficiency, brings replicability. And so, you know, how do we um, support some of that uh, as well? Thank you. That, uh, you know, we, the state of Colorado has uh, been, has grant and, and loan money available for uh innovative housing solutions and we have seen several applications that are focusing on focusing on panelized and of course as my at, during my review of that i'm always asking if it's open or, or closed construction and most of those have been open to this point but they all want to go to closed because it reduces the cost of on-site assembly right so uh, I think we're going to uh, start seeing some of that. So I, I don't know that Donnie and I have reviewed that document in particular, but I sure want to take a look at it. With that, I'll, I'll just turn it over to the TAC and see if you guys have any questions on uh, anything that Ryan's talked about. Dean, I, I don't know who was first. Uh, I think Tim go. was. <laughs> hey, Tim, go ahead. No, that's all right. I think, thanks, Dean. Um, I didn't have a chance to look at all the, the specific language. Um, that was a great summary, Ryan. Thank you. Um, but do these either of these standards actually have reference to any particular code year of, say, the IBC or IRC, or they're, they're more just generic for implementation and oversight? So the reason because, you know, the, the state and all the jurisdictions adopt particular all, all over the board, 2021, 2018, et cetera. Yeah, so um, the standards themselves are sort of process uh, focused standards. So, you know, for the, the statewide program, um, there is a, uh, as you may note, there's a section on uh, or a chapter on design, which is very sort of generic and pushes folks to the, the code that's adopted uh, in the jurisdiction. Uh, I think right now it actually says the International Building Code doesn't give a year uh, or IBC or IRC doesn't give a year. Um, but, you know, that's sort of easily amendable. I think that's really the only reference, you know, to a, a specific code. Thank you. Dean? Yeah, uh, I appreciate that, uh, the overview, Ryan. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, an area of, of sort of inconsistency. Um, we're architects and engineers and work in a whole variety of different states and jurisdictions on project types that range from IRC to IBC. Does the 1200, you'd mentioned it, it outlines the roles of each party. I, I've done a high level brief of both the 1200 and 1205 and, and I may have missed it, but th there's still some uncertainty on, you know, when a, a stamp in a specific uh, location is required or if an architect can, can be licensed in the, jurisdiction in which the module is being built rather than being finally set, depending on the project type. I mean, in some cases, you know, single family homes don't even require a, a stamping professional, whereas, you know, a four story over podium would. Um, do, are these guidelines intended to help clarify some of that? Because it, it it's like we have to spend the better part of a day just researching that for each new jurisdiction we're working in. It'd be nice to have some standardization, um, especially when we're working with developers who are trying to build a more of a national system, systems oriented uh, development program. And, you know, it's anything but consistent from one, one jurisdiction to the next. Yeah. And I, um, it doesn't get too much into the, the sort of details around that specifically, because that 
sort of touches on uh, a much broader picture outside of sort of the offsite construction space. I mean, that that goes into sort of licensure requirements um, and sort of all of those pieces, which, as you noted, vary um, from from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And it's not just sort of an offsite construction you know, type of uh, challenge. So um, doesn't really sort of get too much into the details um, you know, relative to those particular challenges. Do, do you um, but, see a future where it might? Because um, again, I, like that's one of the big wrinkles that eventually needs to be ironed out for for systems building to really be manufacturing and not just home building, you know, in warehouses. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's something that could be. Um, I think we've got sort of lots of different <laughs> different things on the list of uh, what what could be next. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's definitely well noted and, and something that, you know, we can take a look at. Um, I think the important thing um, from sort of our perspective and the perspective of the standards is that um, compliance is determined by the jurisdiction where the unit is finally ending up. Um, and so that's that's sort of the fundamental basis, you know, for the standards. Um, but yeah, we can we can sort of take a look and see if, um, you know, some of those sort of licensure and stamping and approvals process uh, could be something to look at into the future. Thank you. I was going to add for Dean. Uh, I think one of the reasons why it's a little bit tough to regulate that part or have have requirements for that is because it's a state regulated, in, at least in Colorado. Uh, for the licensing requirements for engineers and architects. Um, but typically, uh, our process, we try to clean that up a little bit. Uh, I think it's actually in our uh, plan review checklists uh, for IRC projects. Anything that exceeds the IRC is going to require a stamp. And that stamp, uh, per the door requirements, um, has to be from a licensed professional who um, is uh, licensed or, or uh, I guess, uh, trained in that field. That they're stamping on so you don't want like a electrical engineer stamping a structural engineer's um, documents or vice versa um, and then for the ibc i think in the ibc it actually tells you in there that a licensed design professional has to stamp those documents and and it's in uh, chapter one of the ibc so uh, anything that's commercial with us we require the stamp on it uh, anything that exceeds the irc we require the stamp on it and that's typically going to be your structurals uh, there's not very many designs for plumbing, mechanical, and all that other stuff that's uh, exceeding uh, IRC um, when it comes to the design of uh, IRC structures. But uh, for commercial, um, we do require engineer stamps. So at least for consistency statewide with Colorado, it's not really uh, licensing requirements for the jurisdiction. It's just the licensing of the state door requirements and then our specific um, uh, licensing uh, criteria that we ask for when it comes to the the uh, stamping of documents. Sure. And those stamps need to be of for Colorado licensed professionals, not a yes. licensed professional that happens to work in a factory that is maybe licensed just where the factory is. Yeah. So the that's a state requirement. In order to operate in the state of Colorado, you have to have a license in the state of Colorado um, uh, to operate or use that stamp in the state of Colorado, and, and that's indoors requirements, uh, to my understanding. That, that that that's the genesis of the of I think some of the I don't know if it's confusion or or potential for uh, diversion because if an offsite module is actually being constructed in a different state, then do you need to be licensed in that state because that's actually where the construction is happening versus where the final set is? I mean, I think we all have a, a shared understanding that it's in the state where the uh, where the module is being set, but you wouldn't believe the number of jurisdictions we've worked in that don't actually know because they haven't done it before, right? I mean, this is this is a, an emerging uh, industry in, in a lot of new places. So, you know, they there's some confusion there sometimes. Uh, I'm not sure if Robbie or Kevin was first. Well, Kevin may, may have uh, something to say specifically on this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ryan. I just, well, I am a design professional. I'm a registered uh, civil engineer in, in Nevada. So I, I can respect and honor the fact that we do have issues with 
every state has different requirements throughout the board. You know, in, in, in the case of engineering, some states are discipline specific, like Nevada, you're licensed civil engineer, structural engineer, electrical engineer. And some states are, are like Utah, I believe, is a you're licensed professional, and then you have to work within your area of expertise. So there's a lot of a lot of differential requirements in the design professional, as Dean pointed out. But I think one of the advantages in getting this adopted in different states is that we can come together as states and then work with the state licensing boards where we can kind of find some similarities and work with those partners and and bring some bring these closer together on what we what we need to do for our our community so i think that's one of the advantages i think we can get with some adop some uh, adoption throughout the country mm -hmm. and one one thing i i didn't mention um but you know in addition to the standards icc is engaged heavily in uh education for uh code officials around offsite construction so we've put out some primers on you know sort of the different types of offsite construction you know what standards and codes apply to which um you know we have uh education resources as well to get to you know some of these challenges that folks see on you know bringing offsite construction projects you know to local jurisdictions yeah, because you have the other issue with contractors' licenses too, and then you start mm -hmm. you start running into some of that gray areas that these folks need to be contract licenses, not have con, con construction licenses as well. So, I mean, it's it's a big topic that I think we can start moving the differences closer together as adoption goes down the road. Yeah, the the dream of a national standard for designers, for factories, for GCs. Um, instead of a, a country full of little mini miniature countries, right? Exactly, exactly. Keep dreaming, Dean, keep dreaming. <laughs> Gotta think big, right? <laughs> I like that positive attitude. Robbie? Yeah, I, I was curious. Um, you're, you're talking about requirements for designers and professionals, which I, I think are pretty well laid out. But is, isn't this document really talking about uh, the approved third-party inspection agency? which uh, specifically in the energy code is, is looked at quite differently than in the IRC and the I, IBC and allowing um, folks that, that the authority having jurisdiction approves to go out and do inspection in, in, in this case, I'm, I'm guessing in the factory as well as in the field uh, as well. Is that not what this, these standards are, trying to address? Yeah, so the standards do look at the qualifications of uh, third parties, uh, either uh, plan review or in factory inspection. Uh, the on-site inspections typically fall to the local jurisdictions, um, but the in factory uh, inspections, there are uh, a suite of qualifications, both for sort of the larger third party entity, uh, but also for the individual inspectors themselves. So. Uh, things like accreditation uh, requirements, you know, for the entity itself, um, and then, you know, relevant certifications, uh, you know, for uh, the inspectors. Uh, and ultimately, you know, those third party agencies would be approved by, um, you know, the state program um, and, and selected, you know, by, by the manufacturers. So a jurisdiction could, in essence, outsource things like insulation inspections or other, I mean, I, I focus mainly on the energy code. So energy code related inspections. Yeah, so typically um, what would happen is in the in factory inspections, you would have um, not necessarily a specific sort of energy code compliance inspector, but you would have a, a general inspector um, that would touch on all of those um, requirements. So Dean, where I'm sorry, uh, Dean, hang on just a second. And, and, and Robbie, where it gets tricky is if uh, a home is is uh, being built in a factory uh, offsite structure or offsite offsite facility, and is trying to be you know has certain additional construction requirements above what the state requires to meet. IECC and the and the new model uh, energy code, right, uh, and the solar ready code. 
which we will be adopting. So we're going to be on the 2021 IECC. Um, if there's extra uh, factory inspections above and beyond that, uh, if the, and I'm not familiar with all the different um, uh, green energy and and net zero energy and and uh, other options uh, that homes have now to qualify for uh, the the cost of that may have to be at the expense of the manufacturer if that's what they they want to send a unit out with um, and 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 uh, does that make sense yeah and I, I I'm I'm talking about the base energy code. They, I don't. We're not seeing a lot of uh, Energy Star qualified modular buildings or or you know those types of things. But the base energy code, um, in my experience, looking at modular homes is not being um, executed in the factory or on site. And so I'm curious about the ability to use. Are these standards actually? allowing some additional resources to jurisdictions, to the state, to allow better um, better alignment with the code and, and helping these manufacturers actually understand what they need to change in their construction process to, to meet the requirements. And, and that's why we've got you on here. We, we do want to make sure that when we go to the 2021 IECC, that it is uh, all the third party, uh, the QA manuals uh, and that are coming from the factory and the third party agencies that are doing in-plan inspections are inspecting for that. And, you know, we get a set of plan uh, drawings uh, and if there's anything that you think that we are, uh, need to tighten up on, please let us know. Uh, but when we and then when we go out and do our on-site inspections, uh, those are uh, we'll have the plan sets with us too. And I know there's been discussion about blower door test require uh, requirements also once the unit is all buttoned up, and so that's uh, on the table also for discussion. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, Dean? Yeah, so I just wanted to ask about um, the, on the topic of inspections, uh, you know, pre-industrialized building, um, typically, if, if a local jurisdiction wasn't able to do their own inspections, the stamping professional or the firm that provided the architecture, the engineering was often called on to do that inspection and write an engineer's report or an architect's report um, to, to that end. Um, with the advent of offsite construction, be it fully volumetric or panelized or anything like that, how does the stamping professional fit into that that opportunity? I mean, I think most would rather you know not not be required to do that, but does the stamping professional automatically meet the qualifications for a third party review uh, or inspection, either in a factory or in the field, like we do when we're working on? traditional stick frame projects. Uh, so within. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, Ryan. I thought I was going to no. answer specifically for us, but <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to answer generally. So go, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So uh, we do have qualifications in our uh, it's rule four um, that have the third party agency requirements. And I believe engineering, uh, engineering um, uh, or as a licensed design professional, you are qualified to do it. You just have to apply and be approved for it. Um, so if you were, um, uh, let's say, you know, uh, you see here, um, the, let's say uh, NTA is doing a, um, a factory inspection and there is something that's beyond experience and a licensed professional is needed. Uh, all Donnie, now, you're, you're freezing up a little bit on my end. I don't know if uh, everybody else is. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So let's say that NTA is doing a, a, an inspection at the at the factory and it, uh, there's a, an inspection that goes above and beyond what they're qualified to do. Um, all that we ask.
Um, and that could be you, Dean, uh, if you're a licensed um, uh, or a uh, uh, registered design professional with the state of Colorado and you're approved third party agency, you can go out there and do those inspections uh, as, a, as a secondary third party um, to complete those, those inspections. As a, as a third party agency. So there is a way for a, a licensed uh, engineer architect to uh, play a role offsite, just like you would um, on site. Okay, you just gotta sign up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and relative uh, to um, standard 1205, there is a list of qualifications for uh, third party agencies and third party um, inspection. Um, providers. Uh, it, it's probably a little bit uh, more extensive than uh, what Donnie just mentioned, but um, uh, accreditation, um, you know, as a third party entity um, is, is a key piece of that. Um, but there are you know, sort of other approvals that uh, the adopting, you know, entity, uh, you know, could could recognize as well. And, and what, Ryan, just curious, I mean, what is above and beyond uh, achieving a license professional engineering uh, license um, to, to become an accredited inspector. I mean, it, it, like there is a sort of a hierarchy of, of education and experience and testing and all that. And being a licensed professional is kind of at the top of that hierarchy. So does, does that licensed professional then have to go through additional training to learn what they're designing so that they can inspect what they design? Because again, it's, it's something we've already been doing for, for decades on traditional site built. So it seems odd that that the advent of, of manufactured um, buildings would add an additional criteria for licensed professionals to have to do the same job, if that makes sense. Yeah, so the accreditation is more on um, the processes and procedures in place. So having uh, record keeping uh, quality assurance processes, um, you know, uh, that you do have the expertise and materials to be able to uh, effectively be an inspector uh, or provide those services. Uh, so it's not not really sort of education based. It's more of having those processes in place. Administrative. Yes. All right. Any I want to uh, see if we've got any more questions for Ryan and his team on uh, 1200, 1205, uh, even 1210 and uh whatever the other one was i wrote down the panelized one the g6 um do we have any other questions for for this team i mean ryan i mean you guys looked at our rules um uh you may or may not got into a lot of depth on uh the statute uh was there anything else that you saw that was conflicting between the way we do business because you know it at the end of the day, every state is going to follow its own statute and its own rules. We'd like to normalize our rules as much as possible uh, to make it uh, easier on our manufacturers uh, while still meeting the intent of, uh, of the statute. And we can do that through rules. So, uh, and if you'll answer my question first, then we'll let Donnie take it home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I provided those maybe handful of things that um, weren't sort of, you know, dramatic differences, just some some sort of nuances or expansion. Um, and then, you know, the, the biggest one, I think, is the third party plan review. Um, yeah. and, they, and, that's, uh, and that's been on our list. And we've got to take a look at statute and see exactly what it says uh, with respect to third party plan reviews. And, and Ryan, when I was part of this process, when we were looking at this, we I don't I didn't see anything that was directly conflicting. I think a lot of things fit nicely into several buckets that the standard has that Colorado has. So I think some of the things are just you might require eighteen things in the QA manual, and the standard requires seventeen, right? So we just need to right size that stuff. A lot of the things you are administrative in nature about charging fees and issuing violations. And, and processes that you have specifically to Colorado, which I think you can roll into from an adoption perspective into 1200 and 1205 fairly easily. So I think the standards are pretty open for inclusion of anything specific that's for Colorado, but I don't think there's anything in there that's 
really conflicting. And I, I will say, you know, the sort of the way Virginia adopted it, you know, Virginia has long had a, a program. Um, the way they adopted the standards was basically to say, um, use use twelve hundred and twelve oh five, you know, as the basis, unless you know the the current rules um, are in conflict. Um, yeah, I was so, gonna I was gonna caveat it that the way we'll adopt them. Uh, staff will recommend adoption as. Uh, guidance documents, but when there's a conflict between uh, approved rules and statute, uh, they will take precedent over 1200 and 1205 and 1210. Uh, and that's, and that's pretty standard with most code adoptions, whether it's yeah, right. code or anything else. So that wouldn't be, that would be totally, you know, within the norm of yep. any kind of adoption. And we amend our, uh, our, our codes too. So it's, uh, our codes are you know, 2018 IRC as amended by the state of Colorado. So we've we've done that. Uh, Donnie and then Nate. I was going to say Nate actually had his real hand up earlier, but uh... oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> then let's go to Nate. You can go ahead. All right. Um, I agree that when we first started looking at these, they fit nicely in what we already do. So it's kind of a a no brainer. It fills in some holes, you know, of things that aren't in our current statutes. One of the things I wanted to ask, and I don't think it's necessarily addressed in, in, in 1205 and, and the other ones is the fire sprinkler aspect of things. Um, and I realize we're gonna take this on uh, on this committee, you know, in the next several meetings, um, but just kind of wanted to get your guys' thoughts on that from the standpoint of, you know, during the conversations that we all just had, everybody, you know, well, you guys, you know, a design professional can go out and inspect this or, you know, the, in, uh, the, you know, NTA inspector can inspect that. Well, none of that applies to fire sprinklers from a plan review standpoint or from a inspection standpoint currently in our state. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to ask, you know, is there anything that you guys ever see coming down the pike to try to standardize that aspect of the plan review process, the installation process, the on-site inspection process, um, you know, uh, in the future? Yeah, so um, 1200 and 1205 are, are code agnostic, um, essentially. You know, they just provide sort of the overall process. Um, so, you know, if there are, you know, specific fire sprinkler requirements, um, you know, there, there's sort of the process to be able to, to inspect for those, but does not speak sort of directly um, to that. I think there there may be a, a drop in um, twelve ten on fire protection systems, but again, it's pretty sort of generic. Um, yeah, you know, like, do you, did you intend for it to encompass fire uh, plan review? Um, you know, we deal with local fire departments doing our plan reviews on on sprinklers currently. Uh, in Colorado, uh, as well as some goofy inspection requirements that your inspectors have to register with the, you know, the, the, the state fire agency, you know, to be able to, to do the implant inspections. Um, it's, it's definitely a different process for that in Colorado. I'm not saying it's everywhere. I'm just saying it's in Colorado. And we're, as we try to address that, is that something that we can say you intended these administrative principles to apply to? Yeah. So, I mean, when I initially presented the sort of definition that we use for offsite construction, it's for any, you know, component panel or modularized system that's built in a factory and shows up to the job site as essentially closed construction. So um, it doesn't really sort of differentiate further than that. Um, so, I mean, the, the intent was that you know, somebody, um, typically a state program would have jurisdiction over, you know, anything that qualifies as offsite. Um, so the process should work for, you know, sort of any um, you know, uh, construction. If, if, but, if, if we drag you guys into that meeting with the <laughs> state fire agency, are you willing to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can say that, you know, the standards were definitely designed to facilitate the offsite construction process um, and provide you know, plan review and inspection for offsite construction elements. And um, as a general rule, 
in other states that have operating these rules, does the fire review fall underneath these rules in those other states in general? I, be I believe so. I mean, I, I believe the jurisdiction of the offsite construction programs is exclusive. Encompassing, to, encompasses encomp the yeah. fire aspect of it. Okay. Yeah. Because we, I mean, we, you may have places that have, yeah, yeah, that have, we've lost that here like and that. it's a big pain. <laughs> so, okay. That's good. Thanks. All right, Donnie. And then I want to uh, let our guest, thank our guests and let them go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just real quick. I think uh, for Nate, uh, just real quick, the, uh, the, the I think the problem that we're going to run into with the fire is that the fire requirements are more qualification requirements for the people who are doing the installation and inspections, but it's really no different than the um, the 1200 and 1205 that are requiring certain requirements for a QA personnel or a third party agency doing inspections. So uh, I think just playing the devil's advocate, the fire department would say, well, ICC 1205 and 1200 are are qual or setting requirements for these people to do inspections and plan reviews and uh, and QA, it's no different than what we're doing with fire suppression systems, right? Right, but but um, but in other states, ICC, NTA sets those qualifications and monitors them, not the not an outside agency unfamiliar with offsite. Yeah, uh, I'm just letting you know. Yes, yeah, yeah. What's right. Um, but the, the actual question that I actually had uh, for Ryan is uh, when when I believe it was a 1205, maybe the 1210 uh, was being created. I think it was a 1210 when it was being created. Um, I had asked about um, uh, the, well, at least to us, it's called the offsite construction process. Um, it used to be called AC, uh, alternative construction, where a portion of a structure can't be finished at the manufacturer, has to be finished at the site location to complete the compliance of the structure. Um, but the, when I asked the question during the, he or the hearing or the meeting of the code making of that uh, book, um, they said they didn't address it and they, they left it open for the locals to handle. Um, but I, get, I guess, do you plan on adding that process in these books to add that, that same consistency that you would like from state to state or jurisdiction to jurisdiction um, uh, to finish the compliance of a structure? Because some... Some places might allow the locals to just take over and say, hey, whatever was finished at the factory's, factory's responsibility. And once it arrives to the site location, the locals take care of it. Or, you know, with our program, we say, no, you know, from start to finish, that unit has to uh, be approved as, as approved on the plans. And whatever is not finished at the factory has to finish at, be finished at the site location and be inspected and signed off on through our program. And it could be either us, the third party, or the locals uh, who sign off on that that project. But is that something that you guys plan on addressing in the future? I think right now the way the standards are set up, we do have um, sort of roles of local uh, code officials um, or AHJs. Um, uh, I think maybe even in Chapter One of twelve oh five. It doesn't, I think, get into sort of that level of specificity. Um, I think that varies from from state to state on how they deal with that. Um, I would recommend, you know, when uh, 1200 and 1205 open up for updates that, you know, bring bring that up again and, and we can see sort of if we can get some consistency around that. Okay. Yeah. Scope delineation is obviously huge for for this entire thing to work. And so when we talk about uh, roles and responsibilities, it's it's uh, super painful for any GC to have to deal with two jurisdictions inspecting the same thing. Um, and so clarity there across the board, um, you know, would be a uh, pretty high priority, I think. Yep, I agree. Tracy, did you have a question on uh, 1200 or 1205? Tracy, did you have a question? Sorry, Sam, I'm good. I lowered my hand. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, I, I, I was. Okay. I was gonna. I was gonna say that there are some areas that um, the team that ICC helped put together, or um, for the for the tiny house codes right now, that are working on 1200 and 1205. 
or 12 five and all of that. Um, there's a lot of consistencies with Colorado, I would say, just so you guys all know, because I am participating on that one. And it does refer to the local authority having jurisdiction a lot. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm pretty proud of the team that dived in on this project so far with like trailers getting specific on foundations. Um, so they, I think they went a little bit deeper uh, from what I can see so far. Uh, in some areas and and really focused on a lot of safety features. So I'm kind of excited to see some of that making it in, it in to some of the reviews that are happening right now. So I don't think anything got easier, just so you guys know. Um, nothing got easier, right? And um, I still think Colorado's probably still, you know, it's pretty tough, right? For us small guys anyways, maybe not the big guys, but us small guys. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of consistencies between the two. Good, Tracy. And, and Donnie and I looked at some of that language the other day, too, and w the way we read it uh, does look like it makes it a little easier for the smaller owner who wants to build his own tiny home or a small number of tiny homes to be located in that jurisdiction. It, sh it could be all done by the locals, right? Yeah, uh, so there was a lot of focus on that. One from one snow load, wind and snow load area to another wind and snow load area, right? With a different AHJ as far as where that location goes. To. Oh yeah, there's, there's um, I, for, for the most part, I think that um, they just went a little bit deeper than what we did with Colorado, like on trailers. We're actually, you know, putting appendix, appendixes together that educate people on what's right and what's wrong right like when we did colorado code sam you guys were great in that we said hey you you know you're supposed to be using a built for purpose trailer or if it's self-built you better it's going to have to be inspected by the state right um which that came up uh with what we're working on as well and we just try to take it a little bit of a step further to try to educate the diyers because they did set it up so that way diyers or your you know builder that's only building a couple a year um can still survive per se Yep. Cool. Yeah, I'm uh, anxious to see that final product come out. So uh, with that said, uh, our ICC guys, thank you so much for showing up uh, and presenting. If there's any follow on questions, we'll shoot them. They, uh, anybody on the call can send them to me. We'll send them to you uh, if they didn't weren't able to copy down your email addresses and uh, we'll keep moving forward. So uh, with that said, uh, again, thanks. Um, I know MBI is uh, also a sponsor of those standards, and and um, we've had lots of conversations with some MBI folks also on uh, moving these things forward. So, uh, with that said, uh, that our next meeting is July 9th. Um, I'm going to just open it up for if there's any other discussion. As Nate mentioned, we're trying to get with uh, Colorado Fire Prevention and Control. To have a pre-meeting before we invite them to the big meeting, that's on me to get done. The other thing that Donnie uh, has been working on is to start putting together the draft language of the new rules. Uh, we have added a whole new chapter or section on foundations because we just kind of last time plugged it in where it made sense. Uh, now we're going to add a section uh, uh, on, on foundations because we are starting to do a lot of foundations. And the way that we read statute is that we should be doing foundations not only for residential, but for non-residential also. Uh, so we're gonna try to clarify that. Um, and then, so I'm hoping to have that draft rule out uh, for everybody to start uh, taking shots at uh, and providing very constructive comments as you guys always do. Uh, I'm also going to get a letter out to all of our partners saying that uh, with that draft set, I'll get it hung up on the website and try to start soliciting comments. Uh, come after that July meeting, fairly soon after that, we'll have to submit uh, our draft rules to the Secretary of State for formal review. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't change them once we get that. It's either July or August, uh, late July or late August. Uh, that we have. So we've got a little time to work out some issues with that. 
uh, and have the final set uh, out for uh, published in the Colorado Register. So I'll try to pull that schedule together so everybody knows what we're working toward. Again, we're hoping for adoption in late uh, November or December. Uh, with the, uh, we are going to push uh, for the 21 code set uh, as amended, uh, and we'll add these uh, codes. We'll also add the model energy and model solar ready codes in, in uh, chapter two of the rules. And with that, is there anything else anybody would like to discuss? This meeting is scheduled to go to 1030. Uh, but we always try to uh, keep it to as close to an hour as we can. Can I ask about the foundations that you just mentioned? Yeah. So are we talking full foundation review at DOH? Or... In, uh, in areas of the state. Just the areas, okay. That not... do, that do yes. not have a okay. local building department. Yes, thank you for clarifying that for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, could... It would be helpful if you could summarize the plan of attack you just described. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, because it kind of come into like, where are we going? Where have we been? <laughs> so, where have we been? What have we discussed? I, I like that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do that, Tim. And I'll get, I'll get a note out in the next day or two, probably by Friday evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. On just that. That way we don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel, right? Donnie, uh, Donnie you got your hand up. Yeah, just real quick. Is, um, <clears throat> has anybody put any thought into what they would like to change or add to the uh, administrative rules? Um, so far, I think I have like 34 or 36 changes or additions um, to the current rules, including the foundation requirements. Um, we also put some language in there for tiny homes um, for uh, homeowners who want to build their own personal use tiny home. That wasn't specifically addressed in the previous um, tiny home uh, revisions that we did when the 1242 came into effect. Um, but we, uh, we put in a, a guidance uh, for homeowners who would like to build their own. Um, and then uh, we we added some stuff in there for like plumbing um, to make it consistent with like the electrical part. Uh, whenever the um, state uh, plumbing board adopts a new version of the code, uh, we would adopt that same version. Of course, we would have our own amendments, um, but it would stay consistent with how electrical is being done. Um, and then there's uh, some other provisions in there for the exemptions, um, uh, changes in the exemptions portion. Uh, some revisions, uh, but uh, there's a couple changes in there. Uh, we also did some uh, um, changes for, uh, I can't remember what it was, tiny homes, foundations, exemptions. Um, we got to think about how we're going to um, uh, implement the energy, um, especially 2.7.7, which is the exemption. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to be able to extend into the 2021 unless uh, we get enough uh, information to provide uh, the energy board that uh, whatever that recommendation is, is equivalent or better than the blower door and uh, duct blower test or yeah, duct blower testing. Uh, so that's things that we really need to consider because we, there are some exemptions in our energy amendments. Um, uh, there's also, um, uh, I had a uh, more of a discussion, um, but uh, there are, uh, we have had a couple of people reach out about um, a product that is more of like a residential sleeping unit or a residential um, living unit. Uh, basically, it's not a dwelling, but it's an accessory use building that can be used for sleeping, um, dining, um, or uh, has a bathroom, um, things like that. Um, uh, Laramie or Larimer County has something that's similar. It's uh, their uh, cabins is what they how they define them. So if we have a cabin that wants to, or somebody wants to build a cabin that's just for hunting and seasonal use, but it doesn't have a kitchen, it's not a dwelling, um, but it's being used in, in Larimer County, they have requirements for that. Uh, but we actually do have a factory who's interested in building those type of the units, but we don't have a process in place. Um, and the IRC doesn't really specifically address that. 
Um, so things like that. Um, also, uh, I added some definitions for like temporary structures, uh, temporary use uh, to kind of uh, get the tiny home um, things aligned with how we uh, would, would like to over have oversight over them. Um, and also it would help out with uh, uh, where they can be placed, right? If somebody's going to be placing a, a tiny home in a jurisdiction for two weeks, does it make sense for them to pull a permit just to get their mechanical updated, right? Um, that doesn't make any sense to me um, if it's only going to be there for two weeks, uh, especially if they're only using it for camping. If I'm going to move it for a campsite for three days, do I want to get a uh, pull permit just to update mechanical requirements or insulation requirements, um, things like that, right? So there's uh, some definitions in there for that that we can use. Uh, and I believe in the IBC, when it specifically mentions temporary structures, it does not have to comply with all the provisions of the code. It does have to comply with certain provisions, but not all provisions. And so I think that's how we can fit that in is using uh, temporary structure, temporary use, um, and, and add things like, like that into the rules. But I kind of just gave you a little quick overview of what's, what we're doing. But if you can think of anything else that you would like to add, um, please let us know um, uh, as soon as you can. Um, and then Sam's going to give the overview, of, um, like you said. So, yeah, that's it for me. Um, I wasn't watching whose hand went up first. I'm going to go across my screen. Nate? Donnie, uh, talk a little bit about if you have anything in there um, for third-party inspection stuff. Um, I know we didn't quite have all the processes in place last time we wrote them. Um, as far as, you know, third-party FB inspections, third-party AC inspections, third-party set inspections, is there anything that needs to be added to the rules to clean up some of our past efforts in that regard? No, I have not added anything into the third-party. Um, I did actually change the installer. Um, we have three installation, or not, yeah, three installer registration requirements right now. But uh, as an inspector, um, there's only two, right? And it makes sense because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're doing HUD, modular, tiny homes, or whatever it may be, um, you're, you're following the installation manual, right? And a lot of our training is based on both. So why not just combine them together um, and just have two registrations, one for multifamily, one for single family dwellings. Um, so that's the only thing that I've changed, but nothing specific to third party agencies. And the only reason why, uh, maybe it's just my, uh, how I see it is that with the third party agencies, uh, you know, uh, there's there's quite a few uh, qualifications there, uh, depending on what you want to do, because not everybody, maybe not everybody wants to do plan reviews, so they don't have to be a licensed engineer to um, uh, do plan reviews, right? Um, and so um, uh, there's there, other things in there if you want to be an inspector. Is there, is there any inspection in the entire spectrum of a modular project that cannot be done by a third party in the current rules? Uh, not in the current rules, um, but I think the just because of the guidance through the ICC uh, is like special inspections, right? If a special inspection is required, you need to have a qualified person to do those uh, special inspections. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, but like, but they, but like, they, like a out-of-state factory can use a third party to do an FB inspection. Yeah, the, as long as the third parties uh, approved through us, they can use sure. it. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's nothing there that prevents a third party from doing anything other than the final um, uh, sign off on a structure. And so, yeah, that's one thing that I did clarify um, in my draft. What is that? What is that's like... the, so, currently, um, a manufacturer has the ability to certify their own units, right? But the third party does not have that. Um, so I added, or we plan on adding um, a section there so that a third party can be authorized to certify the rules, the way they're laid out, is that the factory, oops, I think I'm disconnecting again. It's yeah, already been going in and out. We can, yeah, I think we're getting it. Uh, meaning the certification requirement. So a third party agency does not have to be on site for the final inspection to certify the unit um, at the factory location. The factory is already certified to to certify that unit without that third party agency, right? But the third party agency, there's really no role in the third in the in the rules for the third party agency to certify a structure um, in rule. So we're we're planning on adding that 
um, two rules so that a third party can certify. Um, uh, when you say or, certify the structure, do you or is that what I'm calling FB? So when you certify a unit, you're placing, you're certifying either the construction or you're certifying the installation, right? So we have a certification uh, uh, route for installers and inspectors and a factory, but we don't have a certification route or a route for a third party agency to certify. It. <laughs> but I think that's what we were looking at adding. Yeah, and uh, that's where I was getting to is I thought we had a, had a prior conversation where basically the third parties didn't have the ability to do an FB inspection, which is what I, which sorry, what I think Donnie is calling this the final, the final structural inspection, the silver insignia. Yeah, um, so set. I guess when, when you said FB, I'm thinking of residential modulars, right? Um, and FB and R is non-residential, but there's not a process in place right now for a third party to actually certify a unit. Uh, and that's and that's what I was kind of getting at when I said, do we need to add anything to, in the rule? Yeah, to, we're, we are. Yeah, okay. are talking about it and we're just trying to figure out how we're going to do that we do have that uh, coming in place okay okay thank on you our, on our list tim yeah thank you i've actually got two questions i'll start out with more generic uh is there anything in the recent state legislation uh that got passed lots of uh, you know affordable housing pushes adus and stuff like that that, that would affect the, your group and one in particular the Broomfield we're dealing with is the legislation that is going to require a 90-day turnaround time to get a permit out uh, for affordable housing projects. And so we're scrambling with our, our community development group, you know, for doing our full reviews for, say, an affordable housing. But if it was going to be done through your group and then brought in, um, have you looked at that legislation or do you need to deal with any rule changes for that legislation? Uh, Tim, nobody's uh, flagged that to us as being part of our process. The the 90 day, I mean, we can certainly do uh, plan reviews in much, much less time than that. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how the plan review piece uh, fits in with the overall approval of a development project. I really think that's going to be more on the on the locals to okay. uh, figure out because it's all tied to the infrastructure, right? To to get that done. Yeah, I I, I don't I didn't. The only other one that I think is pretty sure. close, Tim, is the ADU stuff uh, with the ADU and the and the a potential model code for ADUs to make sure that modular is taken care of in in that. We did we did add. Um... In the tables, uh, table uh, two uh, for the residential for ADUs, although the ADU bills don't directly affect us, they're going to indirectly affect us because we don't know if they're going to build modular ADUs or modular right. ADUs are going to be popular. Um, but we don't know if the locals is the local uh, building departments are going to require fire separation between the two dwellings. Um, some may, some may not. Okay. Uh, but uh, we put in there that per locals yeah. uh, because there's just too many jurisdictions to uh, try to figure out what that is. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if we want to enforce uh, all ADUs to be fire uh, separated or uh, require them not to be. Um, I don't think we want to you know, mess around with that yet. Yeah. Um, but we also have to think about it on our side if we are having a modular project that's going to a jurisdiction that has no building department. So um, one of the things that we're thinking of doing is just doing the uh, FSD requirements in the IRC. If it's a dwelling unit within five foot of the FSD, as it have the fire separation of the one hour, um, or if it's connected, attached, right? Um, have that one hour separation. If it's not, no, no separation required. So we can keep it as simple as possible. Uh, okay. But we also added a, a radon in there as well. Uh, radon has been coming up a lot, uh, but we don't specifically adopt uh, radon mitigation requirements. And every local jurisdiction is different. So we put in there per locals as well for that. Great. No, thank you. That that, that all sounds right in line with uh, just the way I would be expecting that. My second question, and it goes back to the electric ready and solar ready code adoption that is on our table or agenda, I should say. And I and don't recall if you have a lot of meetings on a couple of different boards that I sit on, but 
did we discuss any detail of any potential uh, amendments or changes to that code before we bring it to the table for a vote? I have, I have not put nothing in, in there for that. Uh, we're just trying to figure out whether or not really what can we exempt still in the 2021, right? Uh, like right now we have the exemption for blower or testing. Um, the other thing I was thinking is there's um, uh, there's some things that uh, the energy code allows you to do that may not be proficient and is not specifically addressed in the energy code, especially for like whole house ventilation, uh, where that location may be, uh, especially if you're pulling air through like a crawl space or something like that, or exhausting air out of the crawl space for whole house ventilation or, or ventilation itself, it doesn't seem uh, efficient. Um, but uh, there is things in there that allow you to do that through the uh, energy code, but it's just, it just doesn't sound right. Yeah. It doesn't work right. So we might put some stuff in there for that. Um, and then I think there's some discussions of uh, some uh, alternative methods of compliance for energy. Uh, energy Star has been brought up. Um, I think, I can't remember, uh, Mike is here, but I, I think uh, Bonavilla, I think they have some Energy Star homes that they actually do. Um, or they have a package, uh, Energy Star package home. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, having more Energy Star rated homes uh, is one of the things that uh, came up. Um, but uh, uh, again, that's going to have to be discussed through the TAC and how we would handle that. Okay, thanks. And, and more of my question was in line with the electric ready and solar ready code uh, that the CEO put together. And I, I recall we had some discussions on, you know, with the from the tiny home, the solar ready, the square footage, et cetera, et cetera, and how that would apply. Um, I don't recall if we brought up there in the chapter one in the administrative portion of that code, it has the option, or it has a, two waiver uh, possibilities to request for waivers to comply with that. One being if it's for a natural disaster, and the other one, more importantly, says, you know, if it if the costs exceed two percent of the valuation of the certain components, then you, they the builder could request a waiver from even complying with all that. And I don't recall if we if I brought that to the table for discussion. And today is probably not the day to do it. I know we're running short on time, but when that gets closer, I'd like to bring that up. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea, Tim. Let's. I'm making some notes on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can just talk about what we did in Broomfield for better or worse, but um, thanks. Yeah. I think you did bring it up in the past and I, I think it makes sense because I think the statute actually says that the provisions are supposed to be cost effective or uh, cost um, uh, conscious, I guess, basically you don't want it to be uh, too expensive to do. Um, but I guess we can clarify that better in rule. what that is. Tracy. Um, Donnie, do you have the, your draft changes that you are working on that are available for us or where would I find that or is that not out yet? It's not out. It's just a working draft right now. We'll try to get that out to everybody, Tracy, before the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to bring forward? With that said, thank you guys so much for uh, volunteering your time and helping us work through these things. Uh, we got a lot to do by the end of the year, and I will get that summary of what we've got done, uh, what we still have to get done, uh, and uh, kind of some next steps to uh, address fairly, very quickly. Uh, so thank you all, and I will, uh, if you have anything else that pops up uh, with the respect to the administrative rules that you'd like to see change, uh, changes to whether processes or confusion or clarification, please, please let us know. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Right. Thanks, Bye -bye. everybody. Thank you.